So my name is Norma Hernandez. I'm a professor. I teach psychology. I teach um, in the STEM field in the sense that I teach uh, statistics and research methods over at Norco College, uh, but I've also worked at uh, Arizona State University, Concordia University, Irvine, Claremont Graduate University, um, uh, UCLA, and Harvard uh, for a year. And so these questions, you know, I've been at different types of institutions, and I was very interested in, in this um, in the session and, and course hero tackling this very important issue. Um, and with me, I have two wonderful students and they've been hand selected uh, because of the experiences that they come with. So first I wanna introduce Caitlin Ishak and Caitlin is currently a graduate student at the University of California Davis in their School of Education. She's working on a single subject science, uh, biology and chemistry teaching credential with a bilingual authorization in Spanish and a master of arts in education. Previously, Caitlin studied biological sciences and Spanish at UC Davis. She's also a research assistant within the UC Davis School of Education, and her primary work is to support teachers of language learners. Caitlin's current goal is to become a high school science teacher and work with English language learners. And in the future, she hopes to enter into an EDD or a PhD program in education. She's an excellent student. Um, so if any of you out there who are recruiting for PhD and EDD students, here is an excellent candidate. And the second student that I have is Linda Rodriguez. She's in her final year at Arizona State University majoring in psychology with minors in communication, social justice, and human rights. Linda is a community college transfer and a non-traditional student as there is more than a 30 year span from when she took her first community college uh, to her last one. She's gonna begin her MA studies in social justice and human rights next year. Linda is also a first generation college student, member of Psychi, honor student, honors council student representative, National Association of Communication Centers at, a, at ASU as a mentor. So obviously she has a lot of time on her hands. She's also the recipient of an All USA Transfer Scholarship, only one of two given at her community college. I actually know Linda, she's a, a former student of mine and, and mentee. I met her at the community college when I used to teach there um, in Arizona. She's completed her honors thesis this year and aspires to have her work enact legislative change at the state and federal levels to do away with the statute of limitations on reporting sexual abuse and sexual assault. Linda hopes, and I should say will be, the founder of a nonprofit to support individuals and families on the periphery of society. So both of these ladies doing really important work and they have some uh, perspective to offer um, in terms of being a student um, and from different types of institutions. So I'm gonna ask uh, first, uh, Caitlin, uh, given that she's working towards her teaching credential and has actually been taking classes and having these conversations about assessment and grades, and she will be in the position in a very short amount of time in terms of being on the other side, not being a student, but being a teacher. And so Caitlin, I wanted to uh, first uh, turn it over to you, see what your thoughts were uh, about the conversation that we just heard. Yeah, for sure. That conversation was really awesome to listen to. All the panelists were amazing and had so much great input to share. I really liked how I know Danny in particular, and I know a few other panelists were also talking about how assessment is progress over time. It's measuring a pro student progress over time. And I personally, my view on it is I don't know exactly, because always I've always seen assessments come with a grade. They always go kind of hand in hand is what I've seen in my experience. And I don't think I like that very much, to be honest, as a teacher, because assessment is supposed to measure progress over time. We're supposed to gauge how students have improved over time, that type of thing. I also really liked something that was um, Yuki was talking about. She was saying that Academic integrity is a two-way street with the student and the instructor. And then I was reading the chat as well. And someone in the chat said that there's a stigma around asking for help. And I totally see that in my own classes. And I feel that as a student. And then as a teacher, I try to minimize that as best I can. That is something that we could get into a little bit later. But I really liked hearing all of their different perspectives and kind of seeing how they fit into my life as a student and my life as a teacher as well. So Caitlin, you're saying that we shouldn't have grades, we should assess over time. Are you thinking about that in terms of being a teacher next year? See, I know grades are necessary because that's what the whole system is centered around. So I'm kind of conflicted, to be honest. I'm not too sure where to go with it because grades, the whole system is centered around grades. And if we were to get like rid of grades, it would have to be like a system-wide change. It can't just be a small scale change. So, so I'm kind of conflicted. 
Yeah. So, so let the revolution begin, but not quite sure we're going to be at the front. <laughs> we'll see yeah. what happens. Linda, let me turn it over to you. What do you think, Linda? What did you think about the conversation that was happening and in terms of academic integrity and grades and assessment? Are these uh, different types of, are we measuring different kinds of things? What has been your experience? And you've had a, a long history in education and coming from uh, being a non-traditional student, uh, coming from a community college, going over to a four state, uh, a four year institution. What are your thoughts? Um, initially, my thoughts brought me back to um, midway through the pandemic, where it was mentioned or thought of that we should do away with the grades and just do a pass fail for students, at least here in the state of Arizona. I'm not sure how it went throughout the rest of the country. And that made me think about if we were to go that route, what do we do with the previous grades that were actually um, earned or learned, as they talked about in the debate? Um, which I really loved the way they contrasted that, where, you know, are the grades earned or are they learned? Um, I think it's a combination of both. And if you were to change the grading system now, how does it affect those of us who are graded and have been graded over the last um, 10 years and the future? So if our grades are going to be used for entering grad school or something to that effect, or even entering the university from high school, um, the change just seems like it might be a little daunting. So perhaps incorporate the combination of both the grades and the assessments. Um, I personally, myself, am not as great of a tester as I am a writer. So if um, I was going to be assessed on my writing abilities, be it in a psychology paper or a social justice and human rights paper, I might be better able um, to benefit from being assessed on my abilities that way than I would be from actually taking an exam. Um, I seem to have like a test anxiety, especially on those tests where they're timed and you know you only have an hour and 15 minutes to answer these, you know, 350 word paragraph uh, questions or essays. And so immediately I start to panic and I feel like time's going to run out on me. I'm not going to be able to do this. Uh, so I end up usually going into Word and typing out everything that I need to say and then cutting and pasting that. But as a if, if I was to be assessed and and graded at the same time, I think it would be better that way. Um, I did really enjoy how Jesse in the panel talked about taking into consideration a student's background from when they were young children and how that would affect their ability to learn as a student, as a teenager or young adult, or even as myself a returning um, older student. <clears throat> because so much of that isn't actually considered. And I think um, as strange as this might sound, this pandemic and putting us in this setting of Zoom learning has been able to give us the ability to actually be more in tune with our fellow students as a student and our professors. Because um, all of the professors that I've had, I know have worked really hard during this pandemic to accommodate our, this, their students to better able to succeed. But I also see as a fellow student, a lot of my students are in bed um, while they're Zooming or they're not even active in class whatsoever. You've got a black screen and the teacher really wants to have that interaction back like they did in the classroom. And there's only three or four of us in a class of like 32. And that to me isn't fair to the educator because we're all in the same place and we all should learn from what's being, or try to accommodate our learning from the way the system is now working. Um, but this pandemic is more than just affecting our education. It's affecting our lives completely and totally. And um, I just, that's pretty much all I have to say for now. Thank you. But that's a really good point that you bring up, Linda, in terms of, you know, our, our students engaged, because there was a comment that was made about, you know, if we have students be on camera, right? Is that an intrusion on their lives? But as an educator myself, when I come across a screen and there's nobody there and all I see is names, it's difficult to build that rapport with students or to even know, you know, who are they in that respect. Kaylin, have you had a similar experience in terms of your classes where students are not necessarily engaging in the way that 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 you would hope? Many, like almost every day, to be honest. So I teach high schoolers. I teach freshman physics right now. And last quarter I taught 10th grade biology. And I'm also teaching 11th grade chemistry at the moment. And they all have, none of them turn their cameras on and I'm not going to be one to force them to turn their cameras on because I know they may have other things going on. Their home setting might not be something they want to show to other people. So I would not be one to force them to turn their cameras on. But at the same time with cameras off, I have no idea whether they're there or not. 
So it's really interesting because I don't know if they're engaged, if they're paying attention in class, if they're actually doing the work, but there have been tools like Google Classroom, for example. Google Classroom has been a really great tool for me in my teaching because I assign different assignments via like Google Docs or Google Slides or something like that. And I'm able to monitor student progress as they're working so I can check in with them and type in the chat. I love using Zoom for teaching as opposed to Google Meet because it has the private chat option. So that's provided me a way to really engage with students who would not feel comfortable like unmuting and speaking, for example, because I know a lot of students are not comfortable with that. But it's hard to tell when they're engaged because I know sometimes they don't do the work during class and I'm checking in and trying to send them chats and they're not responding. So I assume they're not there if they don't respond to me, but most times they will respond to me. And it's been great because I've just been on top of it with checking in on their progress. And, and as a student, you were taking classes last year. Right, uh, Caitlin, I don't know if you were taking in the fall, but definitely in the spring when the pandemic hit, right? Did, did you see this as well, that students were not engaging in the way that Linda's uh, talking about as, as a student in class, not as a teacher? Yeah, so last fall, I was actually finishing up my undergrad at UC Davis. So I was still taking my biological sciences classes and my Spanish classes and that type of thing. I had one professor who required cameras on in class. And I was so stressed about that class because I was like, everyone's watching me. Oh, no. And then like, eventually I got used to it once I like started teaching. But it took me starting teaching to get used to having my camera on all the time in Zoom. Because I was personally like nervous to have my camera on when everybody else was there because there were like 200 people in the class and I'm like all 200 people are like watching me because when your camera's on it like moves you to the front if nobody else's camera is on that type of thing so I was like oh my god they're all staring like yeah so as a student I was I would not like I admit I did not have my camera on very much in like spring quarter when I was finishing up undergrad but then when I came to the teaching credential and master's program at UC Davis everybody has their cameras on. So it's like everyone's interacting with each other. You can see your peers and you can talk to them because the classes are much smaller and there's more of a community aspect there because in the bigger classes, it didn't really feel like a community. It was just the professor lecturing that type of thing. Okay, that's, that's, that's a good point. You know, where you were at the different level of institution, you know, uh, Linda's finishing up her undergrad, you were at the uh, looking more at uh, more specific in terms of, of graduate level work. There's a question by Mike. So I want to kind of shift gears a little because this is an important question um, given what um, I think it was uh, Yoka had mentioned about what is academic integrity. So here's Mike's question. Should students report to their institution or teaching fellow or, te or teachers, fellow students, they know have been cheating? So that they, if they know students are cheating, do they have a responsibility to report such cheating? What do you think? You you want me to take that right now? Yeah, e either one of you, either one of you can take it. I personally, um, I think um, it's an ethical question, and I personally would say, as a student, yes, you would want to report that person if you're aware, if you can prove that they've cheated. Uh, um, for two reasons. First of all, the person who's cheating is not going to gain anything from the cheating. Uh, my, my thoughts on cheating is that you can go ahead and cheat your way through uh, any kind of high school, college, university level, but when you're finished cheating and you have this great grade and you've graduated, how well will you do out in the workforce when you've cheated your way through school and you've not learned anything? So you may or may not pass the interview process, but you probably won't stay there for long if you do end up getting hired by the in, within a position where you should have learned something from school and not cheated your way through. And secondly, um, that coincides with academic integrity. And if you have students that are working hard to achieve academic success, and then there are other students that are cheating, it's a it's twofold. It's um, it's horrible for the person who's cheating and it's horrible for the academic institution where the person is cheating at. Because once you've, you're done with schooling and you've cheated your way through, you're a reflection of the university, the college, the community college, the high school you've attended. So as a person who hasn't learned anything, but then enters the workforce and they realize that you've not actually mastered any part of the position you're in, that's a reflection all the way around on where you studied, where you graduated from, and you as a person. Yeah. So Linda says, yes, let's, uh, we have an obligation to report them. Caitlin, what do you say? 
I say, okay, personally, I'd like to say I would report, but I know I'd be too scared to do it personally. So that's kind of me being weak right there. But at the university level, okay, I've seen this both at the high school and at the university level. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. At the high school, I see, catch my students like Googling answers. They straight up copy paste off of Google and they don't change the formatting or anything. So it's like super obvious. And like, I know you don't talk like that because I've seen your other work. So it's really, really obvious when I catch them at the high school level because they don't like bother to like change it or like change it up and make it sound like it's in their own words a little bit at least. So it's super obvious for me to catch at the high school level, but I know at the college level, it's probably not going to be that obvious to catch. And I think I remember in my physics class spring quarter, this was back when distance learning started, like at the very beginning of distance learning. It was um, one of our midterms. There was a situation where someone had cheated and it was like a group of people had cheated and that delayed our midterm grades until the week of the final. So we had no idea what our grades were in the class because of the investigation into cheating. So it was kind of like as a student, because I know I didn't cheat on that midterm and I was like, I felt a little bit like I was kind of being punished for it because I just didn't know my grade and I didn't know if I needed to like work even harder. Well, I was of course like doing my best in the class, but I didn't know like where I stood in the class. Like I was like, am I passing or am I failing? Or like, I was not really sure where I stood. So that kind of made me feel like it's not worth it because it's going to launch this whole investigation that's going to take forever and that type of thing. But then again, it's not fair to the students who are not actually who are actually working hard to learn the material, because then if someone else is cheating, then especially in like the science classes, if the curve is like because I've had some science classes where the average is like in the 30 percent and the curve is what determines mm -hmm. the uh, yeah, the curve determines the grade, basically. So in that type of situation, I would for sure say yeah because the students who are cheating might end up having a higher grade because they've cheated and they might knock some people out of the curve so that they won't pass the class it's a really touchy subject and it's tricky to explain honestly there's been, there's been a couple of media reports um i think one was from the today show there was another one somewhere out there where students are coming openly saying yes, you know, cheating has increased and it's okay because it's COVID times and we're not getting the education that that we deserve. And so we're going to, you know, continue, blatantly continue to in, engage in that. You know, what percentage of students, I think it is, is gonna be really difficult to measure along those lines, but in your experience as students, have you seen an increase? Do you think it's the same? Are you not aware of it? Or do you think it's gone down? What's, what's, what's your take on it? Linda, we'll start with you. I've definitely seen an increase um, simply because I'm not as technologically savvy as your average student. Um, I started with books and, you know, the little flip cards in the library sort of thing, whereas everyone that I go to school with started with the Internet and how to Google all of that stuff. So I've actually been told by um, several students how I could Quizlet this or Quizlet that or um, literally here's a tutorial on what you can do and you can also, um, if you go into a discussion board and read what someone has said, you can base your answer based on what someone else said and what you read and just kind of tweak a little bit. So it's really ingenious, actually, um, as an older student, how they do it or, or why they do it. Um, but again, it goes, it falls back on integrity and whether or not you as a person um, value that integrity more so than you value that grade. So do you really want to know that you've cheated your way through school or do you want to accept the grade that you're capable of giving of getting because that's the work you've put out? I think it all really depends. Um, but there's some pretty ingenious uh, ways of cheating. I have been told, I've been showed, I've been taught. And I think professors know um, when things are happening. Like if you've got a quiz and you do that quiz or that exam in 10 minutes, you probably quizleted your way through it. If one another student takes two hours, they probably flip through pages of a book to do it. It's not that hard for the professor to actually determine how or when it was, whether or not you got some extra help or, or that sort of thing. Um, and as far as uh, any other venue for cheating, I mean, I think the pandemic has allowed for that because there are some of us who have more than one computer access accessible to us. So that being said, you can open up one computer and sit at another and go back and forth, that sort of thing. 
Uh, but there's a, some genius ways that professors have worked um, as far as I could see this semester. I've got a class, a uh, qualitative methods class that I'm taking where she asks, are you there quizzes throughout the whole class time <laughs> to determine if you're just sitting on a screen or if you're actually listening and paying attention. So she gets to go back at the end of the class time. And if you answer the, are you there quiz portion of the class and the last question as well, then you get credit for having been there. If you don't, then she knows you were just a screen that was sitting open during class time. So I think some you of the think, professors have gotten pretty good. You think that. it's increased, Linda? You think it's the same? You think I that? Think I think it's increased because we don't get to sit in the classroom <clears throat> and have to conform to the professor's instructions on here's your quiz, don't open up any other websites. Uh, you're taking your quiz and you're done and then you can leave. You're at home, you take it on your own time and that sort of thing. Um, so it's easier. It's, it is easier for students to cheat. Caitlin, what's your take on it? I think it has increased from what I've seen in my own classes as a student and from what I've seen as a teacher. And then I'm about to throw my little brother under the bus right now, him and his <laughs> classmates. So he keeps on, he's in high school right now, my little brother, he's in high school. And he's all telling me distance learning is so easy. And he's all like telling me, he's like, everybody just cheats and nobody, he's like all telling me, he's like, everybody Googles the answer. We all have group chats and this and that, like all that type of thing. So I know that like at the high school level, I, I see it going on like in my own house and I'm just like stop cheating because you're not going to like actually learn the material so whenever I see him I'll like stop him and I'll sit down and try to teach him like what he's like trying to google and whatever so I'll be like let me actually teach you this so it can maybe stick and so that you can use it in the future if you do need it so that type of thing I see happening like in my own house with like my brother and whatever's going on and then I'm sure my students talk to each other as well because I know Zoom chat, for example, they can send each other individual chats. One of them accidentally sent me a chat they meant for their friend. So I've seen it like in my own class as a teacher and then as a student as well. I've seen, well, in undergrad, we didn't have like, well, I had a few classes where we had some group chats and then there was like a whole situation where there was a group chat and people sent a midterm or something in the group chat or sent like midterm questions. And there was like a whole big situation with that. It was a biology class and everybody part of that group chat was basically getting in trouble. But that was like the only time I've seen that until COVID started. Once COVID started, I saw it much more. So like everybody, ha like for all my classes, for example, we have a group me for all my classes. We don't like pass, we're all teachers. Like we don't pass things around in that group chat for sure. And, but I know other classes can be different. For example, like in my other classes, like we'll be in breakout rooms. They'll be like, oh, I found this online. Want me to send it to you? It's like that type of thing. We'll be in, like, that's what I was seeing a lot of during undergrad when I was like still in undergrad during the pandemic. It's like a lot of that type of stuff. I've seen it increase for sure. I've, I've been thinking a lot about this issue. Uh, one, because I'm involved with course here, but also in terms of my own students, um, my students learning as a professor, but also my my kids. I have a 14 year old, a 16 year old and a and a 10 year old. And one of the things that I found, uh, my daughter was doing asynchronous learning. So she didn't have a teacher there. Now, now she does, but she didn't have a teacher at the beginning. And she had these assessments where you had these multiple choice questions, but she had multiple attempts in order to do it. And then the questions would switch out the ones that, that uh, you got correct. Actually, the ones you got wrong were still there. And what I found in her learning was that the more often she took the assessments, the more she had to grapple with the information. And so this opportunity to take it two times or three times, I think three was the, the most, even though she didn't like that she had to take it again, I think it really increased her learning. And we've had these conversations about, okay, so you didn't get it right the first time, but you're getting there. You're getting there. And one of the things that I've done uh, as an instructor is I allow students to resubmit the assignment as many times as they want uh, to do that. I had mentioned in the earlier session, I have a nephew who's in medical school and his first year in medical school is pass, no pass. You know, are those options that, that we should consider, you know, a pass, no pass, maybe in the first semester or the first year, would that deter students from doing that? Is it that instructors have to come up with different assessments or is it, in your opinion as students, is it that instructors have to come up with different assessments or is it that students need to kind of 
wise up as, as Linda might say, you know, say, or, or, and Caitlin too, like your brother, like, Hey, you're not getting anywhere with this. So, so stop doing this. Cause you're not going to learn much. I'm just curious what your viewpoints are on that. Uh, Caitlin, we'll start with you this time. Yeah. So I think it's a little bit of both, to be honest, because I feel that students do need to be honest. And then that's kind of where I saw what Yuki was talking about, how it's a two way street, how students, if they're struggling, then we as teachers won't know that they're struggling unless they tell us like we can't tell what's going on in their own lives, in their personal lives, unless they're actually telling us. So it's that type of thing where it's a two way street, because if they tell us, then we can get them the support they need. We can maybe give them extra time or give them some extra support. But then again, also, I was reading, let me find it in the chat. I was reading Nicholas's comment about the cheating police. I see that Nicholas said it's a, the better approach is to change the assessment and instructional approaches in ways that support academic in integrity. I agree with that because as a student, the multiple choice for, for me personally, at least the multiple choice exams were just straight up memorizing. Like I would just memorize, 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 and then go take the test and be like, oh, I remembered like 70% of the material, I guess, because I got a 70 on the test. It was like that type of thing because it was straight mm -hmm. memorizing with multiple choice exams. But then with other exams, it gets harder because like if they're like writing exams and you don't even know where to start, then you're going to just like fail that whole thing. So I do think assessment does need to be changed for sure. What I've done as at the high school level, me and my resident teachers have been back and forth about this. I have one resident teacher who's super like he's he is the cheating police and he he knows it and he tells us that he's the cheating police. So he, he's he's made it obvious that he's the cheating police and he basically watches for cheating like all the time and he tries to phrase questions differently and make questions that students could like get trapped in like he'll ask a question like the chemistry exam they had the other day he asked a question about naming one of the compounds and they had to follow the naming rules that they used in class but if you googled it it gave you a completely different name so he was using that and he ended up catching seven out of 25 kids who used the googled name which was like nothing they learned in class so it was that type of thing. But then my other resident teacher, which I kind of fall more towards, like I lean more towards where she's, her stance on this. She says that the more you try to restrict students and tell them no cheating, the more they will cheat. So what I've, I've done in my physics class and in my biology class, I just let them use all their notes. They're allowed to use notes. It's open note, but not open internet is what we tell them. So if you yeah. let them use their notes, those who are going to use their notes and those who completed the work and have notes to go off of, they will do well. But those who don't have notes, they'll either try to use the internet and I'll be able to tell because they won't change anything or they just won't do as well on the exam because they don't have notes to go off of. And, and that's a really good point. And, and Nick, Nicholas in the chat brings it up and I'm, I'm gonna let you give you a chance here in just a second to catch up. But how do we teach teachers how to teach? Right. And that's exactly why I invited Caitlin uh, to be on this panel, because it has to begin there. And most most professors in higher education, we didn't have to go through a teaching credentialing program. Um, you know, it's it's optional. My my partner actually just completed one, but it's optional. There is no credential that's required for us to teach in higher ed. So we don't necessarily take classes on how to design assessments. We kind of pick it up or we replicate, right, what's, what's been done before. And I just want to reply, uh, before I let you reply, um, uh, Linda, to, to the same question, uh, Nicholas asked me if I'm reading each of the submission for each of the students. Yes, I am. And it takes an enormous, an enormous amount of work. I teach at a community college. I don't have any teaching assistants. Um, and, and sometimes people at four-year universities don't, don't uh, quite understand that, not everybody has. Uh, teaching assistants. I did teach a course at um, Arizona State University where I had 175 students with no teaching assistants. And how was I going to assess their learning in that context? And institutions, I think, put faculty in very difficult positions in, in that regard in terms of our, how are we assessing students if we have 175 students in one class out of four or five and no teaching assistants. Linda, the, do you remember the original question, Linda? Oh, I think thank, you're you for, muted. thank you for asking. Please repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> I think the original question. Uh, oh my gosh, what was the original question, Caitlin? I didn't write it down. What, we got was lost about, in it. Being an, was it about seeing an up? Like, how, no, we already answered the increase in cheating one, didn't we? Yes, we did answer the oh, increase no. in cheating, and I can't remember now what it was. Yes. I can respond to one of the one of the note one of the uh, comments in the chat was whether or not teachers are now supposed to be teaching polices 
um, in regards to cheating and adding more to their academic workload? I don't um, think so, no. I think that um, that's a lot of energy that's expended for no reason, whether you're a teacher or a parent or a friend or a fellow student, um, that's not where your energy should be expended into. Um, I believe that with each course that I've taken, and I'm sure it's the same thing with other students, it's a foundation for the next course. So you start at one level and then you move up and you move up and you move up. If you don't master the um, course of study at the 100 level, you're not going to do well in the 200, 300, and 400 level. And if you don't master those things, then you're not gonna do well in your 500 graduate courses. So the, the cheating part of it really does fall in the person who's doing the cheating. And I think the professor based on certain exams can also see whether or not someone is doing the work or if they're cheating their way through it because when they do answer the tests or their assessment um, results could show the professor what exactly is happening with that particular student. But no, I don't think that um, professors or teachers need to be policing um, the students, especially this pandemic is temporary and you would hope that students would not take advantage of the situation and actually cheat so badly that once we get into in-person learning, you're now going to flounder and fail. But that might be a statistic that will come up in about six months where students didn't learn the material they should have learned and now they're paying the price for it. And, and I think that's the question that we're asking not only in higher ed, but also in K through 12 education, right? I mean, what did students learn? What didn't they learn? Should we give assessments? Should we not? I think it's we're seeing it in the entire education realm. I'm gonna tackle uh, David's uh, question because he has been, uh, been persistent about this question. I appreciate it, David. Thank you for your patient, uh, patience. Uh, but a question, and particularly for you as students, have you used sites like Chegg or Course Hero or others like it, uh, uh, Linda, you mentioned Quizlet to complete your classwork? And I'm going to throw in an additional question. Do you see that as a lack of academic integrity or not? And then why or why not? Okay, so have you used a site like Course Hero or Chag or Quizlet or others uh, to supplement your education? Do you see that as a lack of academic integrity or not? Uh, Linda, we'll let you go first this time. Um, depending on what you use it for, I see it as a lack of academic integrity in regards to you're using Quizlet, Chag or Course Hero to answer all of the questions in your particular exam. I unfortunately or fortunately, however you wanna see it, I'm not that technologically savvy. I literally just learned about Quizlet last semester and how it works. And if you're in a really fast paced um, exam, you probably shouldn't take advantage of Quizlet because Quizlet isn't gonna answer you as fast as you need to answer the questions that the teacher has submitted. So some of the professors have gotten really, um, really smart and they'll do something like you have 10 minutes to do 10 questions. So you've got a minute per question. So you have no other choice, especially without having that technological savviness that all of my other fellow students have, you have no other choice but to learn the material and then answer the question. Um, if you're using it as a reference, I don't think it falls under academic integrity. You might have a question where you're not sure what the answer is, you think you know what the answer is, you quizlet it, and it gives you the correct answer, which is incorrect on your part. And then it would be up to you whether or not you wanna correct your answer. Or do you wanna spend time researching that correct answer and find out where it was that you made the mistake and thought it was the incorrect answer. And um, that's, I'm probably one of the rare students, David, but I just, I-, I And have you know. used it? Linda, have you used Course Hero or Chegg in that way? I haven't used Course Hero or Chegg. I have used Quizlet to determine whether or not I had correct answers and why, especially after the quiz has been uh, completed and you get to see where you were wrong. So the wrong questions, the wrong answers, the ones I got wrong, I would Quizlet them and say, okay, so why did I get this wrong? Because a lot of times, once you're out of the exam, you never see it again until mm -hmm. you meet with a professor and ask them, okay, so why is it that this occurred? But with um, the Zoom, we're not having as much time going over exams. It's basically, which one did you get wrong? Which one do you want to go over? And I'll explain to you why it is that you got it wrong. 
I'm going to come sense. back to that after I let Caitlin um, answer the question. The question was, have you used uh, Course Hero or Chag or other or Quizlet or other sites like that and in your own learning? And do you see that as uh, violating academic integrity? Short answer is yes, I have. And then it depends on if it's academic. For me, the academic integrity portion depends. So let me explain my yes first. So, okay, first year of college, first year of undergrad, living in the dorms, chemistry, the chemistry like series at UC Davis, that killed me. That class was like, that was probably the hardest thing I've done in undergrad, even harder than the upper division classes I've found, to be honest. So we had these like labs with all these detailed like lab calculations that we never like went over how to calculate in class, like during lecture, because that was like a lab thing. And lab was taught by the, like the graduate student TAs. And the TA I had was just like, didn't, they were only teaching lab because they had to basically, they did not want to teach lab. So we never learned how to do like all those calculations. And I was so stuck on the calculations. And then one of my friends in the dorms was like, hey, I have a course hero account. And they posted all the like post lab answers and whatever. So he's like sending me the calculations. And I'm like, I don't know how to do this. And I don't know how to learn to do this. So I ended up using it for like chem lab calculations. So that's where course hero kind of came in. Quizlet where that I would say I straight up use the calculations for some parts some parts I tried to learn it so I would say that is probably academic dishonesty not academic integrity where Linda was talking about using it as a resource so for example I have used Quizlet to learn like the C sets to become a teacher those tests like the California tests that you have to take in order to become a teacher for example I was really struggling on one of the tests for my bilingual authorization I had to take it three times actually to pass that one and I was not sure how to study there weren't really very many materials out there and then I ended up finding a Quizlet deck of flashcards for that and those flashcards ended up being so helpful for me to learn the material I would say that is not academic integrity or that is academic integrity. It's like not being dishonest because I used it as a resource to actually learn the material. Yeah, and and I think both of you hit on, on issues in terms of, Linda, you said, we didn't get to see the exam, all right? And so my, my thing as a professor is like, why don't you let the students see the exam? Why can't they see what they got wrong? Usually when I talk to fellow professors, they'll say, oh, because I'm using the same exam. And that's exactly why we're having this discussion, right? Where course here is having discussion is, well, do we need to, Can is it simply that we as instructors don't want to come up with additional assessments with everything else that we have to do? I, as an instructor put, I mean, I spend probably more hours than, than I know, more hours than I get paid for and more hours that I should in, in assessments, I create new assessments every single semester for my statistics courses. And I don't have the memorized formulas for that particular reason because I don't think it's, they're actually applying what they're learning, but that takes an enormous amount of work in order to do that. And so to what extent are how we're teaching as instructors Right? Are we engaging in the best type of practices? Um, and you know, students should know why they got a question wrong. Right? There should be there should be some type of feedback along those lines. And you know, are memorizing the formulas is that really the best way to teach that course? And are you putting students in a position where they're saying, "Well, look, I need to pass this course, or else what's going to happen?" Or I'm, you know, as, as the panel earlier talked about, are you going to lose your scholarship? Right? Are you going to not be making satisfactory academic progress? And then the only way to make satisfactory academic progress, if you if you're deemed that you're not making it, is to take more classes to increase your GPA or to get beyond that that two thirds threshold of having passed your classes. So this is a difficult conversation that we we need to have as instructors as well in order to provide the optimal learning experience um, for uh, for students. Um, any thoughts in terms of have you, uh, let, let me ask this question. Have you taken a course where you have these kind of authentic assessments? They were different than what you've done before. And you're like, wow, I wish that all my courses were like this. And Caitlin, you're shaking your head. So I'm going to start with you. This was actually one of my education classes in undergrad, not in the grad program. But this professor was, he, I don't, he was like, honestly, my favorite professor. And then he ended up, I was hoping that I'd get to have him in the grad program, but he ended up switching to a different university. But he would write new assessments every time. And he'd have us like explain our, it was educational philosophy, if that helps, but he'd have us explain our reasoning for everything we were doing in that type of thing. And I was, I felt like I learned through the assessment. 
because I had to, and he made it open note. It was during, this was during the pandemic. It was open note. I felt like I had to go back and look into my notes and actually apply what we've learned instead of just memorizing and answering a multiple choice question or putting things straight down from memorization. I felt, and I ended up getting an A in that class, but I was able to apply what I learned. And I felt, I still remember what we learned in that class compared to like my other classes, because I didn't actually have to apply my knowledge. I just had to kind of memorize to get by, get by and get done with the exam. But that class, yeah, that was one of the professors that I love so much. Cool, thank you. Linda? Uh, I had a professor where um, it was an open book, um, open resource exam, but she gave us 15 questions. And from those 15 questions, there would be three of them on the exam. And I felt that that was like brilliant because you had to learn the material to answer the 15 questions you didn't, you really couldn't memorize anything. You literally had to fill out the answer to these questions. And then once the test came into play and you had a limited amount of time, which helped me with my test anxiety of an hour and 15 minutes, I had already put those exam answers into a Word document. So once that question came up in the exam, I was able to retrieve it from what I had created. And that helped me to relearn the material that I had already been trying to study to actually master what was being asked of me and to succeed on that exam. And um, I, I felt that that was like brilliant. And, and I think that with the pandemic, the la I've had three classes that have done that so far. I think that that's one of the most important ways to actually help us to learn is to give us a whole slew of questions, have us study those questions in particular, and then only pick a handful of them and expect us to answer them um, accordingly. Right, so that you know what, what you can expect. Right, we have about three minutes left here. And I think what I hear both of you ladies saying is that, you know, as instructors, we need to rethink, reassess the way that we're assessing, right? Get away from this kind of rote memorization and really move towards the application of the material. And I think where the rubber uh, meets the road here is, you know, how, how do you do this in very large classes? Um, and do we need to push institutions to change class size to make it more feasible, um, to make it more feasible for for instructors to do that, because I just, as as someone who had a class of 175 students, I just didn't see how I was going to get away from a scantron, and it was the only the second time in my academic career in 20 plus years that I had used the scantron, and I hated it, uh, but I didn't see how I was going to grade that many essays every three weeks or every four weeks or every five weeks um, uh, um, in that short amount of time. Uh, Caitlin, any closing thoughts here? We're about two minutes left. So I'm going to give you about uh, 45 seconds. Yeah, I saw in the chat, George was saying something about memorization, about how like students could treat memorization as a like useless exercise. I think memorization can be helpful at some point, depending on the situation, because of course you need to know the facts in order to be able to apply them. But then what should we really be assessing, whether students can memorize or whether they can apply what they've learned? That's where I kind of think application-based problems are better. And that's what I try to implement into my own classes. Project-based learning, project-based learning. Linda, your final thoughts. I think more um, students need to understand the value of integrity when it comes to your own self and, and the value of yourself, as well as academic integrity and whether or not you really want to be that student who cheated their way through school or who actually learned something for a better future, not just for yourself, but those people who you are choosing to work with or help. Yeah, great, great, thank you. I love that because I think that as we look at programming for first year students, for entering students, for students who are transferring in, this is a conversation that we have to continue to have and to not simply assume that people know about integrity and what that means. And at the end, are you really cheating yourself? And to simply say, well, students know this and us not being explicit about it as institutions, I think it does a disservice for students. Thank you everyone who attended today. Thank you, Gio and Mary and our, our uh, captioner, Linda and Caitlin. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Uh, keep an eye on these two ladies. They are rising stars and uh, you will see them again soon. I have no doubt. Thank you everyone and have Thank a great you. rest of your afternoon.